take a look at the computer books at any bookstore and you'll no doubt find a shelf full of books on macros because macros are great tools but very few people really know how to use them. Indeed, in this one book, the author says macros have changed my life. Well, maybe macros can change your life too. Keep watching as we present a guide to macros on this edition of the Computer Chronicles. Computer Chronicles is made possible by Leading Edge, makers of IBM-compatible computer systems, including Lotus Lookalike Spreadsheet, word processing with spelling correction, communication software, and Hayes-compatible 1200 baud modem. Leading Edge, with over 1,000 service centers nationwide. Additional funding is provided by McGraw-Hill, publishers of Byte. Byte's detailed technical articles on new hardware, software, and languages cover developments in computer technology worldwide. Welcome to the Computer Chronicles. I'm Stuart Chaffe, and this is Gary Kildall. Gary, I was looking at uh, macro books before, and this is one of the ones I was looking at. There's about 75 different macros in this book, ranging from a complete menu-driven database system to a macro that helps you write other macros. Mm -hmm. Uh, a lot of people think of a macro as just a series of commands in one keystroke, but in fact, macros have really become a kind of programming language, haven't they? Well, Stuart, that's because they came from programming languages. <laughs> or in the early days of assembly language, it took maybe 50 or 100 instructions to do just even the simplest things. So what a programmer would do is just put one name on that sequence of instructions. Every time the assembler saw that name, out come the instructions. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of like a subroutine in the way it looks, but it's much different than a subroutine because it expands each time right. you see the word. And what's happened, of course, with uh, uh, application programs is that now an operator, a user, can add additional commands and structure to the basic program. Gary, we're going to meet the author of this particular book today and take a look at some of the macros that can help you as a computer user. We'll meet some ordinary people who have written some very powerful macros for their own use, and we'll take a look at an adventure game you play in a spreadsheet, a game written totally in symphony macros. Now, you don't have to be a computer genius to write a macro, as we find out in this report from Wendy Woods. A pottery making operation specializing in Japanese raku technique may be the last place most people would expect to find computers. But Evans Ceramics in remote Hillsburg, California is indeed such a place, thanks to the diligence of Leslie Airy, the bookkeeper. Evans Ceramics employs 25 people and ships some $100,000 worth of fine ceramics each month. That's a lot of bookkeeping. What we do now is we handle all of our disbursements, payables, vendor lists, um, payroll, our invoicing, order entry. There's just very little that isn't on there. I don't think as our company has grown that we, we could have kept our staff to where it is without the computer. When I started, I knew nothing about computers except how to turn them on. And I got the manuals and I read them. And, and it's all I have to do is type in what I want and then hit the right keystrokes in Alt F9 and a letter or a number that I've named it, and it will execute all those keystrokes again. The process of doing the payroll alone used to take a day. The macros Leslie programmed into her Enable integrated software now do the payroll in just two hours. Leslie programs a macro for any task that takes more than five keystrokes. And her work has made automation of the payroll so simple that even new office workers can learn it easily. Evan Ceramics has an interesting philosophy. They believe their employees are their most valuable asset, and the less time they have to do repetitive bookkeeping, the more time they have to be happy and productive. Joining us now is the author of the book Gary and I were just looking at, Alan Simpson, and sitting next to Alan is Lynn Hughes, a financial analyst with TimeNet. Gary? Alan's not only an author, but also teaches computer courses, so I thought I would let him teach us how to, what macros are all about. Well, in a nutshell, a macro is designed to save you some work, save you some keystrokes. For example, you might have to regularly type the time and date into a spreadsheet. By making a macro, you can type a single key that'll type in the current time and the current date. Now you can make many macros like this to type thousands of keystrokes if necessary. 
Another capability is that you can use macOS to extend the built-in capabilities of Lotus. For example, Lotus has no way of just displaying the day of the week for a particular date, but by creating a macro, you can just have a put in a formula that figures that out. So here I type one key and it realizes that today is Saturday. Okay, so you've got essentially a little program in there that's figured out the, the month and the day and right. so forth and computer. Which happens to be the serial date. The modulus is a serial right. date. Which is a function okay. that wasn't sitting in Lotus until right. you created the it's macro. Right, something we had to okay. create. Um, you can take it farther and create um, capabilities that were not just naturally built into Lotus. For example, everyone knows that Lotus does slides, and an experienced user can go from slide to slide by selecting the correct menu options. By making a macro to do that, you can create a little macro slideshow that, by pressing a single key, pulls up a series of slides or graphs, and you can just go through your leisure by pressing a single key again and work your way back to the original worksheet. And how, how, how many keystrokes are you saving there in an example like that, uh, for instance? In that example, maybe 50 or 60 yeah, keystrokes. Just, right, you turned into one hitting of the space right, bar. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and again, it's useful for the people, the user who has no experience mm -hmm. with one, two, three. The most sophisticated application, probably, is of developing completely <coughs> customized menu-driven systems that a novice can use. For example, here's one to manage a database. We bring up the custom menu, and the, men the Lotus menus are now gone. They're invisible to the user. He can get them if he wants. And this custom menu allows us to easily add new records to this database, which happens to contain names and addresses, mm -hmm. sort them into zip code or alphabetical order, pick out particular records, uh, print mailing labels or directory or form letters, and mm -hmm. save the current work. So essentially, anybody can use this without knowing any commands, and this saves hundreds and hundreds of keystrokes. Well, Alan, what, is the, what does the body of the macro look like? Uh, well, this, it, is a, this is a fairly large one, so mm -hmm. it's a little more complicated than most. But I can show you the basic structure. What you did here, really, Alan, is really write a new application, a new piece of software right. inside mm -hmm. Lotus using right, the macros. Right. And here's that, here is the code, the macros, for that custom system. This is the name of it. This is a menu. The menu helps. And these are names of subroutines that handle so the various example, jobs. for uh, example, going back to that last, uh, that last line there, this, the word main menu then is, a, is known to uh, 123 as a part of its macro system. Right. It's okay, a, and it replaces in the, the, the actual names in the menu itself. Right. It has, mm -hmm. It's a new menu that Lotus okay. is aware of is mm -hmm. there. All right, Alan, now as Gary said, you're a computer scientist. You know about all these things. We'd expect you to be able to write macros. I want to turn to Lynn now. Lynn is a normal person who's just a user of computers, but she was able to figure out how to write a very complex macro with hundreds and hundreds of lines. So, Lynn, if you can take over the keyboard here, tell us what your problem was and how you went about solving it. I'm working with a, a very large budget structure for our 1987 operating plan. And our company is so highly structured. The, the structure is so complex that it's just an enormous bulk of information to work with. And I've set up a database to handle the profit and loss statement of our 1987 operating plan. And because, again, of the structure, it's so complex, you have to define a worksheet to either enter information to your database or to print off a report or to, to browse through your information. And if you were doing uh, a separate worksheet for every 125 departments and, and 30 roll-ups and, and whatever it translates to, um, you'd be there for hours. So this macro saves you quite a bit of time. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. So what does the macro do that you wrote? What, it's, what it does is it formats the worksheet for me so I can either print off information that's within the database or enter new budget numbers to the database. Okay, why don't you show it off? Okay. The database file is called budget. Okay, and what we'll do, we'll retrieve the file, which is called Clint. Mm-hmm. And this will take a moment because this it is, is a large the, it is a large worksheet. Yeah, okay. large yes. worksheet yeah. yeah, and what I did mm -hmm. was I loaded the macro into the worksheet so that we could have a look at it. Okay, now what do we have? Okay, this is this is the entry worksheet. And if you can see the question at the bottom of the screen, it's asking me budget for department number. Mm -hmm. And that's a a prompt that I've got in there. And it will ask me to key in a department number and then format my worksheet okay. based on that. 
There's our department number. Now it's asking me how many months, one through 12. Anything less than 12 months, it will give me a choice of quarters. So let's put one in there and just have a look. Okay, there's our menu. Mm -hmm. Now you can see as I move the cursor, not only does my menu choice change, but the description directly underneath changes also. Mm -hmm. It tells me what's in that menu choice. This is all part choice. of the computations that you've done in the macro itself. Right? That's right. That's right. I, yeah, I built mm -hmm. in the macro. So let's choose the first quarter. Now what it's doing is it's formatting based on what I've told mm -hmm. it. I'm going to create the budget for Department 3404 for January through March. So it's pulled up January, February, March, for example, and it's ready for you to enter, enter numbers, huh? That's correct. If you look down at the bottom of the screen, you'll see a line just above the command bar, and it says SD0, comma, mm -hmm. T4. And what that T4 is, is an address. It is cell T4 within the worksheet, and that's where I've stored the definition. And that is Department 3404. Well, it's really it's it's quite a complex uh, task that's performing. It's pretty clear the macro is a very comprehensive. Now you learned to do this all by yourself, and you didn't have any help doing it. Right? No, no so trial you, and error. <laughs> so, so you'd suggest other people try to do macros themselves. Oh, absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. The time saving is is immeasurable. It really is. And when you're talking about time, uh, typically in the past people think of macros as being relatively slow compared to compiled uh, code and things like that. How, how, what the effect is that, Alan, in terms of the timing? Well, it depends on what you compare it to. Mm -hmm. If you compare it to compiled code, like you said, C programming or Pascal, even it seems very slow. But when you compare it to what it takes to do it yourself, typing in all those things, it's very, very fast. Mm -hmm. In terms of time, Lynn, how much time does this save you now that you've written this macro? Now that, I, now that I've written it, I would say 50% of an average day. Um, so you say four hours a day in work by developing this one, this one program inside. This, uh, this one at, this at this particular time of year. Yes, I've got others that, that save me, you know, another 50% on, on each task. And you wrote this inside VP Planner. That's uh, correct. Alan, we were looking at Lotus 1, 2, 3, mm -hmm. before. Well, thanks very much. Now, you don't only have to work with Lotus or in the world of MS-DOS to use macros. Macintosh users can use macros, too, as we find out in this report. Unappreciated, underestimated, and underutilized or so the fans of keyboard macros would claim. Within a different operating environment, like the Macintosh, macros have a new significance, both in the kind of application and its ease of use. At the All Macintosh Computerware Store in Palo Alto, California, a Macintosh users group is taking advantage of the Mac's special interface by exploring a full range of macros to use within a popular spreadsheet program called Excel. Nicholas DePaul uses the program to organize the staff's day-to-day -day schedule. He can set up a spreadsheet with a macro that establishes column and row sizes, headings, and formats. He has substantially reduced the number of keystrokes required to calculate a trend and translates the information into a graph. And when he needs to put an entry into bold or italic script, he can do it with 75% fewer keystrokes. The special nature of using macros on a Mac becomes obvious when you want to create one, using the learn mode of the program. Just pick out the attributes from the various menus, start the recorder function, and watch the code appear in plain English as you enter each keystroke. Macros are meant to take some of the chore out of maneuvering through a program. Why should creating the macro be a chore as well? consolidating commands, simplifying keystrokes, and reducing repetition. Although macros have grown in popularity as more users discover their advantages, their full potential has yet to be realized. Joining us now in the studio is Michael Lunsford, president of MacroPack International and author of 101 Macros for Lotus 123. Sitting next to Michael is Daniel Gasteiger, the macros editor for Lotus Magazine. Gary. Michael, uh, you made a business out of selling macros. What are you selling? Well, it's a software package. It's called 101 Macros for Lotus 123. It mm -hmm. comes with a manual that describes all the macros. And what you see here is the uh, first screen that you might uh, look at if you, if you go and look at the macros themselves. Here's a column of numbers. Let's say that uh, in Lotus you want to go ahead and put the sum at the bottom of that column of numbers. Normally you type at SUM parentheses, put in the range of these numbers and close parentheses. I didn't like doing that, so I created a macro called my add macro. I just hit Alt A and bingo, it does it for me. Mm -hmm. And here's the macro itself. 
you can see that it types for me at some parentheses. It tells the cursor to go up, up to the bottom of the column, end up to the top of the column, period locks in the cursor, end down, paints in the range, parentheses, close, close the parentheses, and uh, hit return. Very simple macro, but I put this on all my spreadsheets. It's very, very useful. Let's say that you want to put in a letter number combination like 123 Main Street, you hit the return, but you forgot the apostrophe. It beeps at you, puts you in the edit mood, mode. I just hit Alt B and it puts in the apostrophe for me. Let's say I want to copy from one cell to another cell. In Lotus, the cursor always goes back to the from cell, but sometimes you like to stay at the to cell. So what I did, I created a macro where I give myself a choice. I can pick copy and stay. And now when I copy down to here, it stays put, it doesn't jump back. And there's a move macro that'll do the same thing. How is the acceptance of this? Do you have a lot of customers? Oh, yeah, it's, <laughs> sales have been very, very good. Mm -hmm. uh, very good. It's you certainly it's, identify with the problems you're describing and you and using with us. Absolutely. It's, it solves a lot of frustrations. For example, there's a go return macro here. If you want to visit a remote location of your spreadsheet with this go return macro with a single keystroke, you can jump back to where you were. Or if you have three prime locations you want to visit often, I use my home alternate toggle. I name the locations home one, home two, home three. And then by hitting Alt H, I can go to home one. Alt H again goes to home two. Alt H again goes to home three. So I'm never more than two keystrokes away from a prime location. Now, one of the things that's so obvious here that uh, you're, you're selling, you're selling a macro package, and, and the source of the macros right here. In the old days of uh, when a lot of basic programs were being sold as applications, the developers are real worried about sending their basic source programs out copyright reasons, uh, things like that. What's, is there an issue with that? This is all completely open architecture. Mm -hmm. uh, these are macros that you can see, you can load them into your own spreadsheet, you can uh, change them, modify them, learn from them. That's a, a, another nice application here. You can use this to, to find out how a macro is written or how a particular uh, macro is, is done. Here's a macro, uh, for example, that you might be interested, how is it done? It's mm -hmm. called jump cell to top of page. It's just uh, 18 downs and 18 ups. Very, very simple, but watch what it does. Let's say you're, you're at the bottom of the screen and you want to see what's in the screen below. One way to do that is to hit the scroll lock, scroll your way up to the top, and then unlock the scroll lock. I didn't like doing that, so I created this jump macro. I just hit Alt-J, and it jumps me to the top. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter where on the screen I am, even a third of the way down, Alt-J, will always jump me to the Michael, top. Michael, you, you wrote a macro in here that lets you do some word processing work inside Lotus. Show us right. that one. It's called my blank memo macro. I'll show you first the, uh, the macro itself. It's right here. It's very simple, mm -hmm. very straightforward. And I've attached it to a blank memo template. You could change this, of course, to your own company name. And what it does is it goes down here and puts in today's date, takes you to the to cell, the copy cell, the from cell, and the subject cell. And then it goes to the text area. And now you can type away. And when you get to the point where you'd like to see what the paragraph looks like, or if you're at the end of the paragraph, you just hit return, and it justifies into a paragraph for you. So you can do some word processing. I can keep on typing uh, the second paragraph, and when I'm all done, I just go back to this main area. It prints this part here in double strike italics, this part here in double strike emphasize, the text in bold, all completely macro driven. Mike, you sell these macros on, on a disk. Now, how do I get the macros inside my spreadsheet? <laughs> OK, I've made that real simple to do. Let's say that uh, this is a blank area of your own spreadsheet. What you do is just do a simple file combine. You just say slash file, combine, copy, named range. Let's say you want the A macro from the A Mac file. It goes, gets that file, gets that macro, and puts it right uh -huh. there on your spreadsheet. That's great. All right, now I want to turn over to you, Daniel. Up until now, we've really limited the discussion of macros to Lotus 1, 2, 3, or spreadsheets. You work on the Symphony world in which you've got a word processor to play with and a database manager to play with. Uh, how, what, what's the added power you can get out of macros in that bigger universe? Working in an integrated environment like Symphony, um, you have just about anything you would need at your disposal um, in your daily work. Uh, communications, as an example, um, allows you to download information from a mainframe or other information source. And when you drop a macro on top of that, you can parse the information down into a form usable by the spreadsheet, do data analysis, print out reports based on that information, and so on. And do that all so, under macro. All under macro yeah. control, all within a standardized environment so that the, the uh, menu structures, keystrokes, and so on are, are very similar and uh, basically give you an easier way to approach 
applications development in Daniel, general. you have a, a report generation uh, macro, I guess, that you worked on. Is that right? Right. Yes, um, we have it on this computer right now. Um, something like we've seen earlier uh, lets you enter addresses and so on into a database. Since Symfony is set up to uh, work with database information, uh, we can look at a database here on the worksheet. And there it is. This is uh, simply addresses of, of people. Mm -hmm. Um, we can also look at the information through the Symphony form window. And this is a more familiar way to work with the information if you're familiar with Symphony. So um, from this, you can print out address labels. So and once so again, on. you've custom made a, a way of handling the mailing. Is, exactly. It's all driven by macros so that uh, you see a familiar looking menu at the top yeah. of the screen, but these are all choices that. I've created rather than that Symphony would normally offer the user. Now you have a, a also a little more interesting, or I can say more fun <laughs> use of macros. Than it's an adventure game that you've been working on. Is that correct? Uh, right. I kind of saw the integrated environment as an ideal place to keep track of all the different variables that you need to keep track of in creating an adventure game. Mm -hmm. And uh, the adventure game is a game that. Uh, lets you, or creates an environment for you, a, an imaginary environment, lets you run around in that environment doing things, and uh, hopefully you come out a little bit richer, uh, uh -huh. <laughs> still alive at the end of the game or whatever, so, depending on the nature of the game. So you're writing a whole adventure game using macros in Symphony. That's right. Um, and I've been able to incorporate many of the different environments um, on the opening screen here. Start the macro. The opening screen is a worksheet window with some text in it, sort of describing the situation a window where Symphony is going to talk back to me. It's going to say, what do you want to do? Here's what happened, and things like that. And then another window down below, which is a communications window, which actually displays text without having to put it on the worksheet at all. And right now, it's asking me, what do you do in response to an imaginary scenario? And What's uh, the advantage of writing this in the Symphony macros? What benefit do you get? Well, the advantage to me is that I have Symphony, um, <laughs> but also that that most of the tools that you need are already there in the integrated package. Mm -hmm. If you're working with a linear program like BASIC or C or some other package, you'd have to create the environment that things all happen in, yes. as well as all the tools all the that you use in that environment. Mm -hmm. So most of the work is already mm -hmm. done for you. A lot of the work is already done for you. I guess, as we said at the beginning, Gary, it's really a programming language. This is not just a situation <laughs> right. where you get a lot yeah, of keystrokes. It's gone way beyond key. the original concept mm -hmm. of stored keystrokes. Michael, yeah. Daniel, thank you very much. Stay with us. We'll be back in just a minute with this week's Computer News. In the random access file this week, it's fall come decks time again as vendors show off their newest hardware and software products. Some 1,300 exhibitors are at the come deck show in Las Vegas. Highlights of the show include the new batch of 386-based computers, low-cost laser printers, desktop publishing software, low-cost PC clones, and a new five and a quarter inch floppy disk drive that holds 10 megabytes. We'll have a special Computer Chronicles report on all the news from come decks later this month. The Japanese seem to be getting serious about the 32-bit microprocessor, a world market now dominated by American chip makers. Fujitsu and Hitachi have announced a joint venture to develop their own 32-bit chip. This follows the refusal of American chip makers to license their chip designs to the Japanese. The Hitachi-Fujitsu partnership comes right after an announcement just a few weeks ago that Fujitsu was buying 80% of American chip maker Fairchild. Fujitsu already owns 49% of Amdahl. The computer hardware business may still be slumping, but the industry's major software firms have suddenly become Wall Street darlings. Ashton Tate, Lotus, and Microsoft are all trading at or near their all-time highs, with analysts predicting strong fourth-quarter showings. Former Lotus head Mitch Kapoor has surfaced after his departure from the company he founded as a student at MIT. Kapoor says he's studying semantic networks and knowledge representation, two key aspects of artificial intelligence. A report out of Cornell University says that if you want a guaranteed successful career, get a Ph.D. in computer science and engineering. The report says that only 400 such degrees are awarded each year and that there are 1,200 jobs waiting for those graduates with salaries ranging up to $100,000 a year. Time for this week's software review, and here's our reviewer, Paul Schindler. Ciao, baby. Have your girl call my girl. We'll do lunch. 
Of course, actually, I'm just practicing for the day when Hollywood buys my script. But I gotta tell you something, Hollywood won't even read your script if it doesn't look exactly right. Scripts follow very precise rules. Page breaks never occur between the character name and dialogue. Breaks within dialogue have to occur at the end of a sentence. Pages must never end with a scene heading. Scenes must be numbered. The word continued must be at the top and bottom of any page where a scene is continued. Now, these are complex rules, things that no normal word processor can do. Scriptwriters need Scriptor from Screenplay Systems in Burbank, California. Scriptor has no screens to show. It just turns files into real Hollywood scripts. You can pay a professional script typist $300 to type your script each time, if you can find one where you live, or you can pay Screenplay Systems $300 once and never worry about it again. Nearly 2,000 screenwriters use Scriptor to produce about 70% of all TV scripts. Now look, chances are that no one will read your script anyway, but I assure you they won't read it if it doesn't look right. So, try Scriptor. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Paul Schindler. The Wall Street Journal reports that Northeastern Software, a major advertiser in computer magazines for mail order software, has filed for bankruptcy. There were reportedly lots of complaints from people who had ordered software from Northeastern, had their checks cashed, but never saw the software. IBM and Carnegie Mellon University this week unveiled what they say is the most computer networked campus in the country. Cabling of the CMU campus is now complete with the goal of networking 10,000 PCs by the end of the decade. IBM also has a joint venture with CMU to develop artificial intelligence applications for personal computers. A Stanford Business School study finds that top executives are using computers about seven hours a week, much more than previously thought. And 93% of them are using personal computers rather than big system terminals. 55% of those execs also have home computers. Finally, if you're a fan of the Rocky Horror Picture Show, you can now do the time warp on your PC. There's a new computer game out called the Rocky Horror Picture Show. It's kind of an adventure maze game, and it's available for the Commodore. That's it for this week's Chronicles. We'll see you next time. The Computer Chronicles is made possible by Leading Edge, makers of IBM-compatible computer systems, including Lotus Lookalike Spreadsheet, word processing with spelling correction, communication software, and Hayes compatible 1200 baud modem. Leading edge with over 1,000 service centers nationwide. Additional funding is provided by McGraw-Hill, publishers of Byte. Byte's detailed technical articles on new hardware, software, and languages cover developments in computer technology worldwide.